Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, drawing conclusions and deriving lessons from election 2016. Progressive activists from around the country speak out next. Every year in November, the organization Race Forward holds a conference called Facing Race. This year, Facing Race took place in Atlanta just days after the 2016 election. It attracted a record turnout, and no wonder people wanted to connect and talk and figure things out. I had a chance to sit down with some extraordinary thinkers and doers from across these beautiful United States of ours, and you know what I learned listening to them? Things may be tough, especially for progressives. We have serious challenges ahead when it comes to moving our country in a progressive way forward. But there is reason for hope. For one thing, activists on the ground have been fighting struggles like this and facing challenges like the current one for years. And in some states around this country, there were actual wins in the last election season. I had a chance to talk with some of the folks who had news of both the good and the bad. Among them, Tarso Luis Ramos from Political Research Associates, one of the premier organizations researching the rise of the right in this country and internationally. Kim Deal from the National Employment Law Project. Issa Pandit from the Center for Advancing Innovative Policy with some good news from Houston. And the two co-directors of the Rural Organizing Project in Oregon a rural organization that has been fighting the rise of the armed right in their midst and in the wake of economic collapse where they live for over a decade. They have a lot to teach. Take a look. These are the people I think should be on TV every day. I captured them on my iPhone. I was so excited. But we're going to be continuing to bring you interviews like this in the weeks and months ahead. Thanks for your support in making this program possible. So Rural Organizing Project works with um, folks across rural and small town Oregon on um, issues of what we call human dignity and democracy. So we work with local leaders, leadership in all 36 of Oregon's 36 counties to build locally based human dignity groups that work to advance um, democracy, human dignity, social gender, gender and racial justice. And um, ROP is a small organization with you know, just a couple of staff and the real leadership for the work is actually folks leading in their own communities, building with their community members and their neighbors to um, advance a variety of issues across the spectrum, but really to ultimately advance the vision of democracy and human dignity in rural and small town Oregon. My longest advocacy experience has been in uh, the reproductive justice movement, and Texas has really been a site of um, some of the biggest struggles, some of the biggest losses, some victories. Um, and I think actually the lessons from Texas going forward now will be particularly important. Before the elections of 2016, I've been doing communications for um, workers' rights organizations and labor unions in the South. Most recently, uh, I, be I became a communications strategist for the National Employment Law Project. And that's an interesting position, I think, as far as thinking about where our capacity is as a movement. We're really lacking on analysis and strategy, um, skills to be able to develop strategy. And I feel like one of the ways that um, I, what I bring to this job and what I think I bring to the movement is thinking about different angles. Where um, are we in relationship to um, how people are thinking and what people need because sometimes in our movements especially elections we think we know what the people need and then what they actually need is something very different and then we see a catastrophic loss like the one we see now. What makes this election different from other terrible elections? A couple of things. Uh, one is this is a different coalition on the right. Uh, the far right, uh, a white nationalist and right-wing populist uh, coalition has captured the Republican Party and uh, won the White House. That's a very different constellation of forces than we've faced before, as awful as other uh, conservative administrations have proven to be. And it comes at a time when um, a very conservative Republican Party now controls all chambers of the federal government and most of the legislatures in the country, trifectas in um, half the states in the country. 
And so the ability to move a tremendously authoritarian reactionary agenda um, exists like never before. Our communities, rural communities in Oregon, and I know it's true nationally, but especially in Oregon, have been really polarized. Um, and in this polarization, we've also seen significant defunding of community infrastructure, and that has looked like the loss of federal, federal timber payments that was actually uh, keeping county infrastructure afloat for over 20 years. And with the loss of that, we now have counties that don't have reliable, reliable 911 dispatch, for example. You call 911 and no one answers. And in that vacuum of a lack of sheriff's department and a vacuum of a lack of emergency response to natural disasters, we've seen the militia movement really grow, which is a way of mainstreaming the white nationalism and white nationalist movement we're seeing across the country. Um, but it's really meeting people's needs, and it's been a really impactful and effective entry point for rural folks that are very desperate and very insecure economically and physically in these communities. I think there are a number of uh, um, factors that contributed to this uh, uh, devastating outcome. One is that the Southern strategy of the Republican Party has come home to roost. They lost control of their own party. They consolidated uh, through dog whistle and eventually full-throated racism. Um, the attraction of uh, white nationalists into one of the parties. Uh, and they now reflect a plurality of that party and were able to choose a president. They did, they were able to elect him. Uh, historically, that base uh, was spread across the two major parties and into some smaller parties and so forth. And so that concentration of white nationalism and, and uh, right-wing populism within the Republican Party was a game changer in this election. Um, but there were other things at play here as well. Um, the capacity to mobilize people's economic suffering and pain under uh, an economic and political model that isn't working for most people in this country and treats many people as though they're disposable. And if there's one thing that potentially links um, uh, the constituency that voted for Trump and the constituency that fought so hard against this outcome is that sense that our people are treated as disposable by this system. Uh, unfortunately, there was only one candidate in this election that was really um, making an argument for fundamentally challenging the system. Um, and so those of us who likewise want to change the system were put in, in a strange position of defense and defending the status quo. Um, that wasn't going to work in this election and we're paying the price for it now. So looking at this election, I think some of the things that we saw being spoken about at a national level and talked about at a national level, level were also playing out in rural and small town communities. So um, some of the um, divisive rhetoric that comes out of the militia and patriot movement that we're seeing in rural and small town communities, ways that people are pitting neighbor against neighbor and actually talking about who belongs and who doesn't in our communities, what the solutions are for our communities, um, are similar themes that are being talked about at the national level. So in rural and small town Oregon, for example, many people are so familiar with the, the, the um, Melior Wildlife Refuge occupation, right? And the conversation that happened around that about what are solutions for rural and small town communities. Well, give it back to the, give public land back to the ranchers and the miners and et cetera, and, those, and get those people back to work. And I think the conversation around um, who is in our community and who belongs was very much a part of what happened there and is also happening nationally. So for example, at the Malia Wildlife Refuge occupation, you know, it was really on burned Paiute land Tri tribal land that happened, the occupation happened. And so for us to actually broaden the conversation, say who are in our communities, who belongs, and what are solutions for what our communities really need, as opposed to some of the targeting and scapegoating that happens that we saw at the national level happening in rural and small town communities, particularly through the militia and patriot movement. So the election in the United States um, did not happen in isolation. Uh, we see a string of right-wing populist and hard-right victories in other countries. Uh, Brexit is often cited as an example of that, um, but not just in Europe. We see this in Latin America with repressive regimes coming forward. I'm uh, Brazilian born in my, my home country of Brazil. There's a, now a coup regime that's come to power. Uh, our children also have citizenship in the Philippines where a right-wing populist demagogue uh, has come to power there. This is, a, this is in fact a global phenomenon. Um, on the one hand, uh, there's tremendous sympathy 
for those in the United States who are confronted now with conditions that other parts of the world are also struggling with. And so we can take some courage and some strength and some su support from other parts of the world, as well as to learn some lessons about well, how one organizes under what are sure to be increasingly repressive conditions. Um, with respect to what is the meaning of the trend globally, um, I think there are a number of things at play again, but in many of these cases, certainly in the European context, there has been an effective right-wing mobilization of resentment, both with respect to changing racial realities and demographics and the failures of neoliberal austerity economics to deliver anything meaningful for the majority. And the genius of the right in this moment has been to conflate those two things. In other words, to blame changing racial demographics in an increasingly multicultural, but pluralistic society on the economic misfortunes of white people. That's, in fact, not what's happening, but it's a very compelling narrative that's winning uh, in more and more places. So we won four ballot initiatives in this country around minimum wage and that it brings it up to 18 states where there are minimum wage laws that are higher than the federal minimum wage. Um, and that I think speaks to the fact that people are working harder for less and Trump acknowledged that as much as he is a con man, he knew that that's what people are concerned about. How is it that people can have this many jobs and still not even be able to pay rent, that the only way people can even foresee their lives is one week ahead at the most, that people don't have vacations. It's awful. Um, and Hillary Clinton just sidestepped that. Um, very out of touch, very, very out of touch. And the pain is real. So what, we, what I think we got right was moving a lot of local initiatives to raise the, min the minimum wage. I think that the first thing is, um, to realize that we can't just be on defense. And understandably, a lot of the conversation has gone to how do we keep people safe? And in fact, the dogs are out and there are many, many vulnerable communities um, uh, that need protection and they, and they need support across the board. At the same time, we have to bring our vision. We have to confront Trump and what Trumpism represents with an alternative progressive vision that addresses people's core concerns. One of the ways I think we need to bring that uh, uh, more effectively than we were able to in this past period is that we don't have a very compelling um, frame or conversation uh, about race in the economy. And one of the most effective things in Trump's campaign was his ability to link those two things. And the basic narrative that was brought is this, that elites, liberal elites, are taking your stuff, you being deserving racialized white makers, and giving it to undeserving takers, dark-skinned, brown-skinned, foreign, uh, non-Christian, dangerous folks, um, and mobilize people to rebel against that, uh, uh, that arrangement. Um, and on the left, among progressives, there's a very powerful movement for economic justice, but it doesn't really talk about race except it's almost an afterthought. Race is a question of disproportionate harm. And we have a very powerful and surging and vital racial justice movement in this country whose economic justice agenda is not adequately understood and is being powerfully developed in this moment through the movement for black, black lives. What's needed, among other things, is in this moment is a much better synthetic expression of our politics around race, class, and especially in light of this election, gender. Um, and gender justice and a counterpoint to the kind of misogyny we saw mobilized in this campaign. Those are lessons we need to learn and to bring in a powerful way. Racial justice needs to be and is a majoritarian issue. It's a question for all Americans, and we need to frame our agenda in those broadest terms without watering down our commitments, core commitments to racial justice, economic justice, gender justice, and so forth. I think there's tremendous capacity to do that. If we're going to be competitive uh, with, with very well messaged, with a very well delivered uh, white nationalist and white ring populist rhetoric, we need a, a, a much more consolidated, coherent game that unifies 
the different major wings of the progressive movement. Up in Arms, A Guide to Oregon's Patriot Movement, it um, covers both the, a lot of research and information about who are the members of the Patriot Movement and the militia movement, what are their roles, what are they doing, what are their strategies and tactics, what are they fighting for. Um, but it also holds up the stories of five counties in rural and small town Oregon who are responding to the um, militia and patriot movement in their communities. And one of the first stories that's held up is in Josephine County, which is in southern Oregon, a county that has um, lost libraries, that's lost 24-hour 911 service, that's lost local law enforcement, and there was an attempted standoff um, with the federal government in April 2015, so almost a year before the Bundy standoff, the occupation of the Malheur Wildlife Refuge. And one of the really big lessons that came out of Josephine County, and then out of Harney County, where the Bundys were, and then out of Grant County, which is a neighboring county where there's a constitutional sheriff who is kind of the golden boy of the Sheriff's Association for um, the militia and patriot movement, is that when community members come together, when they actually speak out and speak against the militia and patriot movement who claims to speak for the local communities, who say, these are the people here, they need us, they want us. Do you hear anyone speaking out against us? No, they want us here. But then when local people come together and actually speak out against it and put out a different vision and values, and a vision as basic as the people who are affected should be making the decisions. We actually need to be in conversation with each other, talking about what our needs and solutions are, not the person with you know, the most guns making the decisions or claiming they have the best solution and silencing everybody else. But when the community members actually speak out, that takes some of the wind out of the sails, right? There actually an is another story coming out of the community of what's really needed. And, the, and that is one of the big things that actually pushes back and um, helps de-escalate the situation as well as challenge that narrative coming out that, oh, we speak for the community. This is what the community needs. And we've seen multiple times either militia and patriot movement back down and step back from what they were claiming to and trying to do um, or leave town, as in the case of Harney County. Finally, the last you know, um, many of the last several hundred militia and patriot members left town when 350 people in Harney County came out and said, no, no, go home. You don't speak for us. Do you speak Paiute? No, you don't. Get out of here. Um, but that when people actually speak out and offer a different vision forward, it makes it harder for that movement to gain traction and actually sometimes le results in them leaving or most of them leaving. Um, we had actually a really significant set of victories in Harris County and uh, Harris County's population is larger than the population of 25 states and it went sort of undeniably blue this season which is uh, was surprising to many uh, but not all. Uh, every single countywide seat was won by a Democrat as well as the sheriff elect race and the district attorney's race and a house seat in Pasadena was flipped from Republican to Democrat for the first time. It was very difficult for us to fully celebrate those huge victories um, on Tuesday night. They were very very significant particularly our sheriffs and DA's races. Harris County is the deportation capital of the country with more people deported um, than any other place, even more people deported than Sheriff Joe Ar Arpaio, who was also ousted after seven or eight elections. Um, and it's not, because we hadn't had um, the attention focused on a place like Houston, we didn't know. And so in the room, in the evening, as we were celebrating the victory, we were also very, very scared for what this would mean for particularly undocumented communities and black communities in Houston. So there is a pallor over the victory. It's really hard to hold it as a, as a singular um, success, but if there's any lesson to be taken away from that, it's that the way to win is in these multiracial, multi-issue coalitions. I mean, we're in a place right now where we are trying to figure out how to keep each other safe. That's our biggest organizing challenge right now, and it's gonna continue through the next four years. You know, how are we gonna make sure that people can live their lives fully with safety and dignity is our bottom line. And that looks like, you know, for folks that are being targeted by the militia and patriot movement, we've been setting up homestays and phone trees and figuring out infrastructure to keep people safe and to keep people networked. 
and communicating well so folks know that they can respond and folks know that their neighbors are coming if they need them. And we're just gonna need to make that infrastructure even more robust and more expansive and county by county and statewide, not just like whoever is being the loudest around the anti-militia work right now, which is, you know, it's actually terrifying. We're a very small organization and I'm answering calls from Portland because it doesn't seem like there's Portland infrastructure to handle some of this. So we have a huge challenge in front of us and nationally it's a conversation. You know, there were 250 people that came out to a strategy session last night where community self-defense, the community defense more generally was really discussed about how are we going to make sure that our you know, immigrant friends and neighbors are not gonna be targeted and also not deported, yeah. particularly those that signed up for DAPA and DACA that have their addresses registered with the federal government now. Like, we have to take a stand and say, no, we're not gonna let our communities be divided by vigilante or increasing state violence. What, when I was trained um, in uh, civil disobedience work, I kind of learned the strategy of surrounding the most vulnerable, peop vulnerable people, physically surrounding them to protect them. And I think we have to do an organizing version of that now, is to surround the communities that will be the most vulnerable and to protect them. And for those of us that have citizenship privilege or have other privileges, to be the ones that do the surrounding. Well, you can get a toolkit if you're interested in learning more about the movement because I think it's more than just about in Oregon, right? We're seeing this happening in other places as well and popping up in other places. I think the other piece is really around, um, you know, there's a lot of us are having a lot of conversations right now and what is rural, you know, I think supporting and um, backing rural organizing, right, and engaging in rural communities right now. There's a lot of our people in rural and small town communities, right, who actually need support in this moment because there is a lack of infrastructure. There is a lack of support. There's a lack of domestic violence resources. And so um, being able to really support and advocate for the resourcing of rural and small town communities in this moment and, um, and also organizing in rural and small town communities I think is a really big piece of it. What I would add to that is we have also seen in the state of Oregon that our political leadership, despite being a Democratic majority, have completely abandoned rural Oregon. And it's to the point where, as I mentioned before, we don't have 911 dispatchers that are there 24 hours a day in certain counties, and no one at the state level is tracking that. Mm -hmm. And that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable for any state. So I think that there's something that we really need to do in this moment to really call attention to failed political leadership that might agree with us on the values, but the implementation in rural communities hasn't been there. One of the most important lessons is, is that actually the way to organize communities of color is to find the leaders in those spaces and engage them, not just on the get out the vote, the sort of pound the pavement work, but on the messages. The messages that will resonate in those communities come from within those communities. We had a bunch of um, uh, young leaders who are themselves targets of police violence and it, unjust detention and deportation who were formulating the messages that we use to educate the communities that they live in. And so, that really, I mean, grassroots, the definition of, the word grassroots gets tossed around a lot. Um, but I think what it really means is that the, the folks from the communities that are most effective are the ones that are not just doing the pound the pavement work, but also the strategizing and message development work in those communities. I think many people are frightened uh, in the United States in the aftermath of this election. And um, one of the most important things we can do to break that fear is to take action. In fact, as scary as the, this moment is and as treacherous as the days and weeks and months ahead truly are, we in fact have um, a capacity to mobilize and reach um, perhaps a much larger number of people than we did before the election. Um, people are struggling to make meaning of the moment and eager to do something to change the course of this country. And so the most important thing is not to retrench in this moment. This is a moment for reaching out and realizing that um, we will have new allies uh, in places that we can barely imagine. And so this is a moment for outward thinking, expansive thinking, thinking about a larger notion of the we. Um, this is a moment where um, people know the world is watching and people know that the future of their children is on the line. Um, and so new things will be possible. And so. We have to come with hope and courage and um, clarity about who's to blame 
uh, and who we need to organize uh, into a more constructive alternative. Thanks for watching, everybody. You can find out more about the organizations we feature on this program at our website. That's lauraflanders.com. And thank you for your support. This sort of programming isn't brought to you by corporations or government grants. It's thanks to contributions from viewers and listeners like you. And if you want to check out our podcast and just listen to us every week, you can do that too at lauraflanders.com. And thanks. <laughs>